Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, I believe this is the last piece where we don't know who the author is, where it's unknown. Um, I find the background interesting in that through textual clues, they're able to figure out who wrote it. Um, excuse me, not necessarily the, the, the name of the person, but the type of person. Certain references, the dialect, they're able to place, you know, where to put the northern area, northwest area of England. Um, you know, the, the, the writing techniques, the, the knowledge of French and Latin, that wasn't a normal commoner. It was somebody who was, who was educated and well off. And so they're able to kind of paint a picture as to who this individual uh, more than likely was or type of person. Um, it's interesting when they talk about some writers' characters, uh, characters, uh, character is whatever that word. Sir Gowan as a ruthless, bloodthirsty warrior. Um, we really don't see him in that regard. Um, this is just an excerpt, so the rest of the story may be. Um, but what we want to focus on here, you see the, the lit term archetype, archetypes. Um, you know, these certain types of, of characters, you know, the damsel in distress, the heroic knight, you know, that type of thing. Those are, those are phrases and names and roles that go throughout history uh, in literature and movies and books, you know, and all of that stuff. Um, so as we go through this, look at, you know, the, the, the role of the hero. I think straight off we can say that that's probably Sir Gawain or Sir Gawain, however you want to say it. Okay, and then you have the villain or the dams and all this. As we come through the story, try to put these titles with certain characters. Um, ultimately, when we get to the Green Knight, people think obviously he's the villain. He's the antagonist versus the protagonist. But does he truly represent that role of villain that we expect a villain? Is there a moral? Is there a point? Um, throughout the story of Sir Gawain, we again come back to what a knight truly is, what they believe, their practices, their nobility. You know, there, there's the PowerPoint on Moodle where it talks about their, their pentagram, their four or five things, well, it must be five, it's a pentagram, the five things that, you know, the, the way that they live their life, you know, being good to women and being chivalrous and all of that stuff, but being honor bound, having honor is huge. You've seen that in movies, you know, samurais and stuff. People would rather die than be captured, and so they fall on their sword. Right? That's very, you know, uh, you know uh, Roman to some degree with regards to Brutus and, and uh, some of those other emperors, um, you know, from, from the past. Um, so anyways, uh, follow along. Uh, we're going to uh, go through this. It'll take a little bit of time, and uh, we'll talk about it upon completion. But it's a Sir Gawain, or Gawain, and the Green Knight. back to the beginning. We start to get those archetypes. Um, page uh, 175 or so. We come right at the beginning with the Green Knight there. The physical description. Does he come full out armor for, ba for battle? No. He simply comes with his axe on his horse and everything that he has is green and so on. Um, and he approaches them. If you look down at the bottom of a uh, 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 well, it's actually on 176 now. He comes in and addresses everybody, and everybody gets kind of, kind of quiet, because uh, this is a huge, monstrous man with a monstrous axe. And he says, "I've come to uh, speak to the person in charge." And off Arthur, King Arthur says, "That would be I." And he goes, "I've come to search you based on reputation." Remember how we talked about the the honor. Okay, people don't do, you know, if the knights do something, it's a reflection of Arthur. And Arthur, as we know from all of our, you know, illusions of movies and cartoons and stuff, that, you know, he is a good guy. Um, and so uh, uh, Arthur even welcomes him. He goes, uh, line 74 or so, Sir Knight, you are certainly welcome. I am head of this house. Arthur is my name. Come down. Come down and eat with us and we'll have a good time. Then line 79, but my intention was not to tarry in this turreted hall. But my intention was not to tarry. Oh, I just read that. But as your reputation, royal sir, is raised up so high, and your castle and cavaliers are accounted the best, the mightiest of mail-clad men in mounting fighting, the most warlike, the worthiest the world has bred, most valiant to vie with in virile contest, and as chivalry is shown here, so I am assured at this time, I tell you, that has attracted me here. So he goes on in great detail and say, I've come here because of the reputation. Did you notice some of those alliterations sprinkled throughout there? Hopefully you did. I mean, I stumbled on the most valiant to vie in virile contest. That's kind of nice. Line 71, 
get, greet that gruesome guest. So those are nice little things that hopefully they pop out and like, oh, oh, that's alliteration. You know, just little fun things to say sometimes. Um, and he says, I am not here for trouble. No armor down there at the bottom. I, I didn't bring anything. There's no other weapons. I left my hauberk and helmet. I've left all of these other armor things back home. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm here for a challenge. I'm here to, not necessarily a game, but to see if people here are as good as their word. And so he says on page 177 that I am here not for war. And I shall offer to him this fine axe freely that they strike a blow in return for another. So I will let you use my axe. You can take a shot at me, but I want to get a shot at you. And so when I survive the blow that you give me with this axe, you will have to come and find me afterwards on your honor. Can you see how this is a game of honor and so on? Well, Arthur says, oh, well, surely you're, you jest. This is ridiculous, but I will do this. If this is what you truly want, I will do it. And we all know that Arthur, based on what we know of him from the past, you know, is true to his word and so on. By heaven, what you ask is foolish, but as you firmly seek folly, find it you shall. So if you're, if you're looking for death, getting hit in the head with an axe, we'll surely do it and I will give it to you. Not out of punishment, but that's, that's what you're looking for. Um, and no good man here, so his other knights, is aghast at your great words. So we're not sitting in quiet out of fear. You know, I'm, I'll do this. I'll do this. Hand me your axe now for heaven's sake, and I shall bestow the boon you bid us gave. So I will take care of this business. But we have Sir Gawain, Gawain, Gawain I call him, who jumps up and says, no, let me do this. Is that kind of a noble thing? Because think about it. If Arthur for some reason fails, their king has to willingly take a hit with an axe. Do you see Gawain getting in the way and say, no, you're too valuable, you're too important, you're the king, let me take this for you. Let me deliver this shot, and if for some reason I fail, then I alone will take the shot. So a very noble thing, yes. Compared to the knight that we've been experiencing thus far, the type of knight from the wife of Bath, do we see a big difference? Uh, Raper and this guy. Big difference, okay? And so he says, I will do this and I will take the ax. Um, where's the actual beheading there? On line 182 or so, uh, they're kind of getting the groundwork going. He goes, when I have taken the blow after you have duly dealt it, I shall directly inform you about my house and my home and my own name. Then you may keep your covenant and call on me. And if I waft you no words, then well, may you prosper. Stay long in your own land and look for no further trial. So if after the deal, I'll tell you where you can find me. I will give you my name. There are no tricks here. And if for some reason I am unable to or I choose not to tell you my name, then the agreement's done and you don't have to come and look for me. Okay, it's kind of like those things where be careful what you wish for, that type of thing. Make sure you understand exactly what agreement, what contract you're getting into. The knight from the wife of Bath, he didn't know that he was going to have to marry that woman, did he? No. Would he have still done it? Well, how much does he value his life? You know, probably. Um, but here, Gawain, Gawain is trying to figure out exactly what's going to happen, and so they decide to, uh, to have the fight there at the bottom of 176, and by fight, I just mean contest. Um, the Green Knight graciously stood on the ground uh, with his head slightly slanted. He even got down, exposed his neck, the naked neck, for the business now due. Gawain gripped his axe, gathered up, and slashed down. And what happened? Well, well line uh, 203, the fair head fell from the neck, struck the floor, and people spurned it as it rolled around. Blood spurted from the body, body bright against the green. Think about visually. All that stuff's green, but now we're just shooting red all over. Um, Yet the fellow did not fall, nor falter one whit, but stoutly sprang forward on legs still sturdy, roughly reached out among the ranks of nobles, seized his splendid head, and straightway lifted it. Then he strode to his steed, snatched the bridle, stepped into the stirrup, and swung aloft, holding his head in his hand by the hair. He settled himself in the saddle as steadily as if nothing had happened to him, though he had no head. 
And then the head will obviously have to tell him his name and where you can find him. Are you envisioning this? Cut the head off. The body walks over. I mean, you've seen a comically where a headless body is looking for a head on the ground, right? I mean, that was in one of those, um, probably the middle ones. That was the worst one, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean. One of those zombie guys gets his head cut off, and so he's crawling around trying to find his head, which was the shell and all that. Um, but anyways, here, so he picks it up, goes, mounts his horse as if nothing's wrong, and he's holding his head. Can you imagine the visual of everybody else? If I'm Gawain, I'm thinking, you should be dead. And then he's thinking, oh, God, there is no way that if he takes off my head that I will be able to pick it up and still live and survive. And so, oh crap, this is not going to turn out well. And that's where we, uh, where we uh, um, you know, continue on here in a little bit. And so the knight tells him, you have a year to find me. You can find me. I'm the knight of the green chapel. Green chapel, no kidding. Everything green. Um, here's where you come to find me. Come or else be called coward accordingly. Line 232, 233. Come or be called a coward. And it's not just Sir Gawain being called a coward. We've got to understand that mindset. Who would that be calling a coward? Arthur and everybody else. The knight came here specifically to challenge the best that earth has ever bred, is what he was saying. And so this is the moment. And now Gawain has a year to think about his impending doom. Is he going to go? Do we think he's going to go and take the axe shot? Is this all a test? Is he going to trick something? I mean, these are all thoughts that should be going through your mind um, in this you know, kind of lengthy introduction just to set up the fact that this guy is having some supernatural abilities that the normal person, like probably Gawain, does not have. And so that will lead us into, uh, into the, uh, the coming up here with him looking for the night. So at the bottom of 181, uh, he's gone off on his journey. He had a year and a day to find it. And throughout the book, you, I'm sure there are tons more adventures, probably more uh, of those uh, you know, uh, battles or actions that might have given him why scholars think he was bloodthirsty or was a certain type of a warrior. Um, even uh, uh, the Green Knight at one point comments on, you're, the, you're Gawain, you're Gawain, and you, yet you flinch, you know, that type of thing. Um, and anyway, so that, that plays off in the other book, and that's why it's condensed there. But uh, <clears throat> he stops at this house, this castle, um, you know, to a green chapel nearby. And when he, he's allowed to stay there and hang out there, but the rule is that whatever you receive, the, the hunter, the owner of the house, the husband, says, whatever you receive, you must give to me. That seems kind of weird. So what possibly could he receive while he's there? Well, we find out that the wife, really kind of starts to come on to him over time, okay? Real flirty. She's, she's a temptress, okay? Very seductive. Uh, she gives him a kiss. What does he do when the husband comes home that day? Because the husband's going to share his, his food, share his everything with him as long as, Gawain, you share with me. And so he gets kissed. What does he do to the husband when the husband gets home? Kisses the husband. I'm sharing. Honor. This is what I said I would do, so I'm going to do it. She attempts to give him things, you know, jewels and everything, and he, he rejects that stuff. She pretty much throws herself upon him, and he rejects it because he is a good guy. Remember the whole night thing. They, are, they treat women well, whether they're married or widowed, okay? And that would be wrong. It would be in violation of his, you know, of his pact uh, with King Arthur to be a, to be a good uh, knightly individual. Um, she eventually does give him a green girdle, um, a green corset, a, a sash, some sort of clothing that he can wear under his stuff. And she gives that to him and he actually accepts it. Okay? Which isn't necessarily so bad because she says, you wear this and no harm will fall upon you. That's about the best thing you can say to somebody who's getting ready to go get hit in the head with an axe. The husband comes home, and Gawain does not give up the girdle because why would I give this? This is going to save my life. I'm not going to. So he breaks his word. Okay, he becomes a coward, and it might not be the coward that we 
associated with coward. You know, people running away crying or fearful. In Beowulf, uh, you know, he fights a dragon. His whole people run away cowards. Here, he is selfish and coward about his life. About, hey, you gave me a, this is a wild card. He doesn't know I'm going to have an ace up my sleeve come time to get that shot in the head. Um, and so he does leave and he keeps that girdle for himself um, and doesn't give that away. Page 185. He roamed looking for this man. He roamed up to the roof of that rough dwelling. Then from that height he heard from a hard rock on the bank beyond the brook, a barbarous noise. What? It clattered amid the cliffs, fit to cleave them apart, as if a great scythe were being ground on a grindstone. Have you ever seen people sharpen in medieval time, sharpen knives, sharpen swords, they had a big stone wheel spinning. You know, they might be pushing something on their foot to keep it spinning, and then they put their, the blade on it, and it sparks and everything. Or you might see somebody carving, a, you know, to get something sharp. And so he hears this noise that sounds like something's being sharpened. Well, it turns out it's the green knight. So what is he sharpening? The axe, which is, he probably doesn't want it to be too sharp. He being Gawain. Okay, he doesn't want to get hurt by this thing. And so he hears it, you know, happening. And um, so he screams out and the, and the, um, and the green knight comes. He says, Bide there, said one on the bank above his head, and you shall swiftly receive what I once swore to give you. And so he comes and pretty much vaults over the, the brook, over the river. Um, I'm a, what are you kind of envisioning this guy looking like? I'm kind of like some kind of Paul Bunyan, big lumberjack type guy. Are you kind of similar? Like a Thor guy, kind of, minus the hair probably. Um, the pretty hair. On page 186, um, the actual confrontation that has been building up and building up for a year, um, Gawain gets down, the knight addresses him, they have a little back and forth, and he gets ready to hit him, and it's one of those kind of like, you've had friends before probably that have come up to you and go like that, ah, you flinched, come on wuss, you flinched. And so he chastises him. Um, he tells him, take off your helmet uh, and offer no more argument or action than I did when you whipped off my head with one stroke. No, said Gawain, by God who gave me a soul, the grievous gash to come, I grudge you not at all. Strike but the one stroke, and I shall stand still and offer you no hindrance. You may act freely, I swear. But uh, page, uh, not page, line 401. Uh, the dauntless man would have died from the blow, but Gawain glanced up at the grim axe beside him as it came shooting through the shivered, shivering air to shatter him, and he, his shoulders shrank, a little flinch. Shoulders shrank slightly from the sharp edge. Could you hear it when we went through this, all of those alliterations? I mean, it's almost hard to say. You almost have to slow down, but that's, those are great examples of alliteration. Um, you are not Gawain, said the gallant, whose greatness is such that by hill or hollow no army ever frightened him. For now you flinch for fear before you feel harm. I never did know that knight to be so coward. I didn't know the knights of Arthur were so cowardly that you flinched. And that upsets him, obviously. It's calling into question his, his loyalties, his oaths, his, his manhood. Um, he says, do it again. I will not flinch. Go on. Game on 185, 187. Excuse me. Um, I shall stand your stroke, not starting at all till your axe has hit me. Um, Gawain waited, unswerving, with not a wavering limb, but stood still as a stone or the stump of a tree, gripping the rocky ground with a hundred grappling roots. Then again, the green knight began to gird. So, now you have a whole heart. I must hit you. May the high knighthood which Arthur conferred preserve you and save your neck. If so, it avail you. Then save Gawain storming, oh, excuse me, then said Gawain, storming with sudden rage, thrash on, you thrustful fellow. You threaten too much, so get on with it. Uh, the blue text, though it swung down, savagely slight was the wound, a mere snick on the side so that the skin was broken. It's hard for me to even read some of this alliteration. And so he got hit, but it barely hurt him. 
Okay, he really didn't even go all the way through and take his head off like he did with the, uh, like what happened to the knight. He just dinged him. And so there was some blood. And we find out all along that Sir Gawain was never really intended to get any nick at all if he stayed true to what his words were. It comes out that the knight knows about the girdle. Well, how could the knight know about the girdle? Well, who is the knight? He's the husband from the Green Chapel, the hunter. And so he knows all about the wife giving that to Ar uh, not Arthur, giving it to Ga Gawain. And so he knows that Gawain's not going to get hurt. Okay? And so if he never violated his oath, the most he was ever going to do was scare him and probably wasn't even going to hurt him. And then, congratulations, you guys are honor. Okay? You guys exude honor. You are like what you say you are. And not just you, but King Arthur and the other knights. But since you lied, that's why you got the nick, the snick on the neck. Sir Gawain, happy that he's still alive? Relieved? Angry? Sad? A little of all? But ultimately, the main one you need to get away from this is Think about it. You live your whole life a certain way in honor code, and you were just proved to be a coward, and you broke your oath to be a knight, and you broke your oath to Arthur. How do you think he's going to respond? Embarrassed? Have you ever had somebody say to your parents, not necessarily, I'm mad at you, I'm angry at you, but I'm disappointed in you, Justin. You just, I'm just very disappointed in you. Wouldn't you rather have them say that they were angry at you? Because they can get over the anger. I'm sure they'll get over the disappointment, but yet that they just thought so highly of that person, then not so much anymore. Okay? And that crushed him. Um, page 188, the Green Knight explains along this, uh, this le uh, bottom portion about what he was doing and all of these things. He goes, for that braided belt you wear belongs to me. I am well aware that my own wife gave it you. Your conduct and your kissings are completely known to me, and the wooing by my wife, my work set it on. So the wife was a culprit in this, and the Green Knight pushed her along. Hey, try to seduce him. See what happens. We're testing him to see what's, uh, if he's truly a good, uh, a good person or a coward, as it turns out. Um, 510, curses on both cowardice and covetousness. Uh, their vice and villainy are virtues undoing. Um, uh, where I, blah, 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 blah. You finally see that now I am faulty and false and found fearful always in the train of treachery and untruth go woe and shame. I acknowledge, knight, how ill I behaved and take the blame. Award what penance you will, henceforth I'll shun ill fame. Do what you need to do. You, I violated this. I am so, he's horrible. He's humbled. His life is, is a lie now. He feels horrible about it. And the knight pretty much says, you know what? I forgive you. It looks like you have um, had enough penance and soul searching and you've learned your lesson. He even gives him the girdle, take it with you. Take it with you. Go, go and tell the story. And in fact, why don't you come back to the house and we will celebrate, was it New Year's? Is that what it is? We'll come back and celebrate this cold New Year. I'm not mad at you. So now we need to go back and look. Remember the archetypes we talked about? We have the, the protagonist, the antagonist. Who is the real villain of this piece? Is there a villain? What was the purpose of the Green Knight? Simply to challenge. Challenge King Arthur's and his crew and see if they truly are as honorable as they say, as legendary, as good sold people as legend has, as the stories have it. And so that's the ultimate purpose. And so can we really call him a villain? Probably not. But yet, isn't he that antagonist early on? You know, the antagonist is usually good versus bad. Because Gawain is, well, we should care about this guy. And so then all of a sudden, we find our hero has all of these faults. OK, have these, all of these flaws. And we see the knight you know, really coming out better than anybody else. And so he maybe is the protagonist in a weird way, even though he's not, because the story follows Gawain, and so he's the protagonist. But yet, I don't think, uh, you, you know, the whole good versus bad, protagonist, you know, hero, villain, protagonist, antagonist, it's kind of a, a muddleness. 
you know, very murky. We don't understand uh, exactly who it is. Um, and uh, it, it's what's kind of interesting about it. But we do have the damsel in distress. We have that woman, the temptress, um, the sexual being that's trying to corrupt the hero um, and take him down the path. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, satanic in some degree with regards to trying to lure the good person away with the forbidden fruit, you know, something similar. We could maybe connect uh, down the road, but it's very similar to, to those. So, um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, really, story-wise, we're done with knights.